So I'm a proud member of the faculty at the Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland. I've been that, doing that position for 17 years. But I took a chance over the past year and I'm now doing research at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, as much as I love my job, I'm exploring new and creative ways in which I'm working now with data and with looking at patents. And patents, as you may know, are a really important part to the level of innovation that we have. It's a way for us to share our thoughts and ideas and to put out into the public what our creative endeavors are. And if you take a look at the graph behind me, you'll see that patent activity has increased over time. In fact, we had a bit of a milestone a few weeks ago. In April 2015, patent number 9 million was issued. And this is quite an accomplishment. As you may know, patents are numbered sequentially based upon their issuance. And so we could go back and look at patent number one being issued in 1836 and recognize that patent number two million came out in about 18, uh, 1936, so a span of 100 years for two million patents. We've issued two million patents in less than the past 10 years. This is an incredible change in the rate of innovation that's all around us. And because I haven't forgotten about my roots at the University of Maryland, I often think about what we're doing in education to help support this creative endeavor. In fact, even if we just take a look at the types of innovations that are going on in our classrooms, would it actually even follow this curve? Would it potentially, unfortunately, be decreasing? So when I was a rookie professor, I was 28 years old, and I was thrust into the graduate classroom, and I was asked to teach students that were about my same age. And the picture that I had in my mind of that experience is something that looks like this. And this picture from the movie The Paper Chase has a professor in the center of the room, the focus of attention, all eyes are on them. And while this is an incredibly, I would say, selfish experience, the thought that people are paying attention to the professor the way many of all of you are paying attention to me, thank you for that. Uh, there's actually a fear that every professor has, especially a rookie professor, not yet 30, which is they're going to start asking questions. The students are going to start asking questions to which the professor doesn't know the answer. The professor's job, of course, I thought, was to take what was in his or her brain and impart it on the students. In fact, the very idea of asking an exam was that I had an answer key ahead of time, and I was just taking a look at how well the students knew what I already knew. And that's helping us understand, let's say, innovation from patent number 9 million and before, but what are we doing then to help people who are creating and designing beyond that? Was I open to the possibility of them answering, question, answering the questions that I prompted in new and different ways? And would I give them credit for them or I mark them down? So if you think about the creative endeavor, is it happening in the classroom? And perhaps our classroom experience has become this, where we still have the same lecture hall, the professor is still in front of the class and teaching or teaching, but our creative students all around us are paying more attention to something that's 13 inches in front of them on their desk instead of the person who's standing at the front of the room. It might be a good thing. Maybe something creative is going on in front of the student that the professor can't see, but certainly the professor is not engaged in participating in learning. Because professors, as certainly I was when I was a rookie professor, thought that learning was teaching. So in his TED talk, Ken Robinson said that we do not grow into creativity, we grow out of it, or rather, we get educated out of it. I couldn't agree more. I know I was doing my part to help educate students out of creativity. But for me, something happens. I was very lucky. A little over seven years ago, I was moved into a learning community at the University of Maryland called Quest. And these have some of the most fantastic students that you can imagine. They come from engineering and business and science, and they come together and they form teams and they create and they learn. 
and their classroom looks something that's more like this. Where's the professor? Not there, right? Where are the laptops? Not there. What's happening is that the students in this Quest program are starting to recognize creativity in their peers, and they're amplifying it, and they're making it special. And I knew very early on when I joined this program that there was no way that my teaching style was going to be conducive to learning, because these were students who were creating and designing and innovating and supporting each other who were exposing their vulnerabilities. And of course, my vulnerability up until this point was that someone's going to ask me a question that I didn't know the answer to. But these people were asking questions of each other all the time. And they were the ones who were helping drive innovation. So one of the first things they did was they gave me this t-shirt, said, take off the bow tie, get on the bus, and go to orientation with members of this cohort. And I started recognizing that I became liberated from all these things that I thought being a professor was all about. It's not being teaching. It's about participating in a learning process, about providing stewardship over that learning opportunity. It's a great opportunity. Frankly, it's incredibly fun. And I had taken the fun out of it because I was trying to expect students to learn things that I already knew. So I'm very thankful to my students that they helped reinvigorate my academic career and make this happen. And I'm very optimistic that we can do a better job of allowing the creative process to happen in our education system. But something's got to change. And I think, for me, the model of education that has changed has moved from something that becomes a push system, whereby we're ramming in content, filling the pipeline that exists between us and our students, potentially on purpose, because the more we cram, the less likely it is they're going to use exploration and creativity to ask us things we don't know the answer to. And professors, perhaps, should do one of the hardest things they have, which is to shut up. And allow the students to sit there and be on the receiving end and start asking questions. And we need to do a better job of sometimes saying, you know what, I don't know. I know you think I should know, I've got all these degrees, I've got all this experience, but I can only teach you what's been done before. I can't help answer that question. And that's an important question, and that question is something that's going to drive our innovation forward. So I'm very optimistic about what can be done. And it's not about completely technology, it's not completely about the students, it's not completely about our faculty, but it's a system-wide thing that we need to think about. And I think that thinking about the opportunities for pulling content could help us. Because certainly, if we're so busy pushing stuff that they can't allow creativity, and we need to amplify creativity, just as those Quest students did, and just as I try to do now. So, when I think back that, to the quote from Ken Robinson, and I think about what we could be doing, that if in fact creativity could be educated out of us, maybe we can be educated back into it. I hope you think about doing your fair share. Thank you for this opportunity. <laughs>